ಸಹನಾವತು ಸಹನೋ ಭುನಕ್ತ ಸಹ ವೀರ್ ಕರವಾವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿನಾವಧೀತಮಸ್ತು ಮಾವಿದ್ವಿಷಾವಹೈ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 ಮೇ ದ ಲಾರ್ಡ್ ಪ್ರೊಟೆಕ್ಟ್ ಅಸ್ ಬೋತ್ ದ ಟೀಚರ್ ಇನ್ ದ ಟಾಟ್ ಟುಗೆದರ್ ಮೇ ದ ಲಾರ್ಡ್ ಪ್ರೊಟೆಕ್ಟ್ ಅಸ್ ಬೋತ್ ಬೈ ಗಿವಿಂಗ್ ಅಸ್ ದ ರಿಸಲ್ಟ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ನಾಲೆಜ್ may we attain vigor together let what we study be illuminating may we not cavil at each other om peace 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 all right so we were studying the katha upanishad and we were on the final mantra of the second chapter second section the 15th mantra of the second section yes we did some of that last time i want to wrap it up uh, with a couple of few more observations the mantra is very famous na tatra suryo bhati na chandra tarakam nema vidyuto bhanti kuto yam agni ತಮೇವ ಭಾಂತ ಅನುಭಾತಿ ವಿಭಾತಿ ದಿ ಆತ್ಮನ್ ಅವರ್ ರಿಯಲ್ ನೇಚರ್ ಆತ್ಮನ್ ಬ್ರಹ್ಮನ್ ದಟ್ ಇಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಇಲ್ಯೂಮೆಂಟ್ ಬೈ ದ ಸನ್ ಇಟ್ಸ್ ನಾಟ್ ಇಲ್ಯೂಮೆಂಟ್ ಬೈ ದ ಮೂನ್ ಬೈ ದ ಸ್ಟಾರ್ಸ್ ಬೈ ಲೈಟ್ನಿಂಗ್ ವಾಟ್ ಟು ಸ್ಪೀಕ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ಮಿಯರ್ ಮಾರ್ಟಲ್ ಫೈರ್ ದಟ್ ಶೈನಿಂಗ್ ಎವ್ರಿಥಿಂಗ್ ಎಲ್ಸ್ ಶೈನ್ಸ್ by its light everything here is lit up you shining you the real atman you shining everything else shines here everything else means uh, mind and senses and by your light by you the light by you the atman everything here is lit up now this was swami vivekananda's favorite mantra he quoted it often uh, first for the sheer poetry of it and also for uh, the very central philosophical point being made here this is the swami vivekananda's favorite upanishad katha upanishad and in this katha upanishad his favorite mantra i think why is this important it's important because it tells us that this sat chid ananda which we are our real nature which has been pointed out again and again is it revealed in its real nature and is it revealed in any other way in this world what is our real nature number one that's the big question here second why is it that we don't know it and how can we know it what is the what is not the way to know it and what is the way to know it all these are are poetically expressed in this very climactic mantra of the second section of the second chapter um the sun doesn't reveal it because uh, the sunlight starlight light of the moon lightning fire because it is not uh, something that is known by the senses you cannot see it hear it smell it taste it touch it that's what is meant by this light reveals what you can see with the eyes so in the daytime we see everything by sunlight um if the sun goes down this from the upanishad if the sun goes down then how do how does one see how does one interact with the world how does one go about one's business by the light of the moon suppose the moon is also not there then how does one go about one's business how does one see uh, the other by the light of the fire but today we'll say we have so much electric light all around us but suppose everything goes away you know, all the lights are down how does a person know that somebody else is there in this dark room by the sound of the voice this is from the uh, this is very upanishadic by the sound of the voice you know you say who's there and somebody says i am here you know somebody is there um now if the voice also uh, fails how does one know at all it's by the light in the mind you know by consciousness we know our, by, everything is known by consciousness the point is really sunlight doesn't reveal anything 
really it's the eyes which see but really the eyes do not even see it's the mind which sees it's not even the mind which sees it is consciousness which sees if you want to be symbolic about it you know when he talks about it's simply an example sunlight moonlight firelight lightning uh, and so on but if you want to be symbolic about it the sun represents the most uh, outermost way of we, we uh, experience the sun illumines a physical object and that in connection with our eyes with sense organs we illumine something uh, so that is a sense object a sense and object contact eyes with the forms ear with the sound tongue with the taste uh, that is the that is being symbolized by the sun if you want to be symbolic about it then moon um the moon is the symbol for the mind in in vedanta so even the senses do not light up the point is the sun does not light up the world it is our senses which light up the world even the senses do not light up the world they are themselves lit up by the moon what uh, by the moon means by the mind and fire symbolic in vedanta in vedas fire is the symbol uh, symbolic of the speech so what is expressed by language there are things which we cannot see or hear or smell or taste or touch but language can express it uh, thought can think of it conceive of it none of them can objectify the self the real you they are all objectified by it how will you objectify mind even cannot think about it what does the mind think about the mind can only think about something for which it has got traces it has got some impressions past impressions we collect it through our senses in this life or past lives and the mind cannot have any uh, traces or uh, understanding of the atman mm. so um, the mind cannot by itself think about it of course a mind trained in vedanta that's a different thing um, the intellect cannot conceive of it intellect conceives of things which are brought in by the senses from the world or which come up from our own memories from our mind that's what the intellect thinks about but the self is behind that also it's not an object to the intellect so there are no vasanas there is no samskaras in the mind which can help the mind make an object of the atman then one might say then how do we at all know about the atman what is the upanishad doing you know we claim in vedanta how does one know the atman let me explain that a little more how does one know this cloth for example it is um, the uh, the eyes are, are the source of information about this cloth and the mind the mind plus the eyes we get the knowledge of the cloth uh, the how do i know the sound of the swami's voice it's mind plus the ears the ears give me that information and the mind can know this the swami's voice how do i know the taste of the cookie which i eat it is the mind plus the tongue so how do i know about black holes and super strings it is mind plus a science book so the mind operates various pramanas sources of knowledge to get knowledge i'll repeat that to know anything it is the mind specifically the intellect which operates various instruments of knowledge what are these instruments of knowledge they are our senses Uh, they are uh, uh, scientific instruments like the microscope and the telescope they are uh, books which we consider authoritative like books of science and the books of religion uh, religion tells us about things which we don't know through the senses heaven and all it they work if if that will work if you believe in it science works uh, because it is experimented upon and data is collected and we take the books as authoritative and that's how mostly science works you know and this little uh, addendum here and say no 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 science works for experiments but most of us we don't do the experiments the experiments have been done and the data has been collected theories have been formulated put in the books and we take the books as authoritative and we have good reason to take the book, books as authoritative science works that way we have good reason to take it as authoritative because there is a community of scientists who vet it we call you know peer reviewed publication so there are community of experts who make sure that these books are authentic 
and it's backed up by uh, real knowledge. But we take the books as authentic. So the books, mind plus book gives us scientific knowledge. Mind plus scientific instruments gives us scientific knowledge. Mind plus sense organs gives us knowledge of the sense world. Mind plus what will give me knowledge of the Atman? Mind plus what will give me knowledge of the Atman? The standard answer is mind plus Vedanta. Mind plus Kathopanishad will give you knowledge of the Atman. Mind plus Vedanta. The Vedantic texts give us knowledge of the Atman. So the Katha Upanishad, the Mundaka Upanishad, the, uh, all texts based on the Upanishads, Drik Drishya Viveka, Aparokshana Bhuti, you know, or the Mandukya Upanishad and Mandukya Karika. Mind plus Vedanta gives, Vedantic texts gives you knowledge of the Atman. Now here somebody might uh, object that. Um, so is the Atman an object for the Vedantic texts? Mind plus eyes gives you knowledge of forms. Why? Because forms are object for eyes. Mind plus the ears gives you knowledge of music and speech. Why? Music and speech are objects for the ears. Similarly, if you say mind plus Vedantic texts gives you knowledge of the self, are, is the self, Atman, Brahman, pure consciousness, an object of the uh, uh, Vedantic texts? But didn't you say it's not an object? True. It's not an object. It's not even the Vedantic texts can objectify the Atman. What do they do? They dissolve the erroneous understanding or misunderstanding that we are not the Atman. That I think I am body-mind. I do not understand what the Atman is. That lack of understanding, that wrong understanding, error, not only lack of understanding, but that error that is removed, that is dissolved by the Vedantic text. Vedantic knowledge, precisely speaking, has a negative role. It removes our misperceptions. Then we are left under no uncertain, um, you know, no uncertainty. We are absolutely certain about what we are. After Vedantic study, Shravana, Manana, Nididhyasana, what happens actually? You stop looking for the Atman. The search stops. Why does the search stop? It is very careful here. People will misunderstand. The search stops. Why does the search stop? Not because uh, the Atman doesn't exist. And that's an atheist. The one who thinks no such thing is there. A skeptic, atheist. Or not because maybe the Atman exists. Maybe it doesn't exist. We can never know about it. Therefore, I don't. I have stopped searching. That's an agnostic. Second kind. Not because of that. Or um, the, I have lost interest. I tried lots and I attended lots of classes. Now I've lost interest. And that's not a non-serious student. Why does the search stop? It's because you have found it. Not as an object. As you yourself. There is no more doubt at all. You have found it as the source of all knowledge. Why, why would you need a special knowledge of the Atman? It is actually the source of all knowledge. Just as no light can illumine the Atman, and yet it is Atman is the source of all light, like this the mantra says. Similarly, no particular knowledge is necessary to illumine the Atman. Atman is realized as the source of all knowledge. It's like, I give the example of the eyes. By, with the eyes, I see all these things and I say, the proof of the computer is I see it with the eyes. The proof of the book is that I see it with the eyes. The proof these people are present is I see it with the eyes. Now, uh, the existence of something is proved by seeing it with the eyes in this example. Then what is the proof of the uh, existence of the eyes? Because I cannot see my eyes. You would tell me, look at your picture in the computer, zoom. But that's a picture. I can't see my eyes directly like the way I'm seeing all these objects. So I can't see my eyes. Does it mean that the eyes cannot be proved? It's a doubtful thing whether eyes exist or not. No. See, by seeing with the eyes, I'm so clear that these objects exist because I saw it. We say, I saw it with my own eyes. I'm so clear about it. Then about the existence of the eyes, how much more you are clear about it? How much more you are confident about the existence of your eyes? Without seeing your eyes. Without actually seeing your eyes. All seeing is made possible by the eyes. The eyes seeing, then everything is seen. The, uh, the eyes are the proof for everything else. What is the proof for the eyes? 
The proof for the eyes is the experience of anything and everything. Seeing the book is a proof that the, the proof that the book exists. Seeing you in the Zoom call is a proof that you are there. But what is the proof of the eyes? Seeing the book is a proof that not only the book is there, but the eyes are there. Seeing you on the Zoom call is not only a proof that you are there, but the eyes are there. Seeing anything is the proof of the eyes. And closing the eyes and blank and seeing nothing is the proof of the eyes. Because when nothing specific is seen, you're still seeing. I mean, it's a very simple thing. Eyes are functioning. Just because I draw a lid of thin lid of skin over it, do the eyes actually stop functioning? No. The eyes are doing exactly what they are always doing. Similarly, I am consciousness is proved by being conscious of what? Of anything and everything. You're seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, remembering, loving, hating, waking, dreaming, sleeping. All these are proofs of one thing and one thing only. You are consciousness. You, that consciousness shining, everything else shines. Everything else means all these knowledges, they come forward. They, they arise. All knowledge arises because of that. That is the meaning of this. What is the, so this proofs, what are you? Your pure consciousness. The proof of pure consciousness that is given in this mantra. It is because of experience. What experience? Every experience. Experience of every object, whether it's a physical object outside or it's a subtle object in the mind, every object proves that you are consciousness. Not only that, the absence of all the objects also proves that you are consciousness because the absence is also a kind of experience. So experience is the proof uh, of not only the objects of experience, the objects of experience, one can be mistaken about it. Yeah. One sees railway lines stretching away to the horizon and they are meeting at the horizon. Optical illusion. You're seeing this and yet it's not correct. Yeah. But one thing you're not wrong about, that there is experience going on. Consciousness is there. Yeah. That you're not never mistaken about. Do you see, objects of experience, one can be mistaken about it. It could be an optical illusion. It could be wrong understanding. So I might be mistaken about things in the world. I might be mistaken about scientific theories. I might be mistaken about anything, existence of God. But one thing I cannot be mistaken about is consciousness. Impossible. You cannot be mistaken about it. This Vedanta shows you that consciousness you are. Is it manifested? You are that pure consciousness. You are it's manifested as pure consciousness and it's also manifested in all conscious experiences. Um, even a subtler point I will make here. You know, the way I am talking and the way we teach Vedanta, the question often arises, well, to know myself as consciousness, one needs the objects of experience. Without the objects, there is no experience. If there is no experience, I cannot know myself as consciousness. Let me repeat that and see if you get it. I'm saying that what proves that you are consciousness is because you have experience. But what makes experience possible? Consciousness shines on certain objects. Seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching, thinking, remembering, understanding, uh, loving, hating, whatever the objects gross or subtle. Consciousness shines upon them, gives you an experience, and now using Vedanta, you realize, I am consciousness. But a subtle question can still remain. Well, in that case, at least, consciousness is dependent on the objects. Consciousness cannot know itself as its own existence without, without its objects, without mind. Wrong. A little more subtle, a deeper and subtle point I will raise here, just is worth thinking about. Consciousness does not depend uh, for its self-realization on objects. How so? If I ask you, if anybody asks us, do you exist? Our answer is yes, I exist. You see, if anybody asks me, was such and such person there on the Zoom call? I'll have to look and say, yes, that person is there. I need to check with the world to answer yes or no. But if somebody asks me, are you on the Zoom call? I'll say yes. Now, my point here is simple but subtle. 
to understand the question, I need ears, I need mind, intellect, of course, consciousness. To reply to the question, I need my mouth, I need mind, um, you know, memory, knowledge of the language, all of that processing capacity, I need all of that to, to understand the question, to process it, to answer it. But the subtle point here is, did I check anywhere to answer whether I exist or not? No. To answer whether you are there on this Zoom call, I have to check, I have to see whether your face is there or not. To answer whether I am here, I don't have to check anywhere. And to actually answer it, I need mind and speech and all that. But the source of that knowledge, I didn't have to check. It is always shining. It does not depend on an object. This is called Swaprakasha. Consciousness, every the knowledge of all objects, external and internal in the mind, depends on you, the consciousness. The knowledge, the revelation of consciousness, the shining of consciousness does not depend on anything, not even on the mind. This is a subtle point. If this is not clear, you'll be left with the faint impression that all of this is great, but still the mind is necessary for the consciousness to know itself. No, it's not. For, to understand the question, you need the mind. To uh, devise the answer, you need the mind and the mouth and all to speak. But to the essential fact that is self-revealed. Consciousness is not only shining, it's self-shining, it's self-revealing and revealing everything else. In fact, um, Shankaracharya here makes the uh, example. In his commentary, Shankaracharya says, just as um, firewood, hot water can burn, not by itself, but because of the presence of fire. Wood doesn't burn. But if it's burning a log of wood, it will burn you. Why will it burn you? The, it is because of the presence of fire there. Water doesn't, um, you know, it's not scalding, it's cool. But it can um, cause blisters because of the presence of fire, heat in the water. And heat by itself can burn. It's exactly like that. Nothing in this world can illumine itself or anything else. Yeah. A pot cannot know, know the table and the, um, the book cannot know the table. The book cannot know itself, the table cannot know itself. But consciousness, the mind equipped with consciousness can know the book or the table. The mind cannot know itself or anything else. But illumined by consciousness, the mind knows itself and everything else. So uh, it is consciousness which shines and reveals everything. We are that pure consciousness. We are pure existence, pure consciousness, and a pure bliss. Always remember what is meant by pure consciousness, pure existence, pure bliss. So what is impure existence or impure consciousness? <laughs> I'm using the words like that. But what it means is simply this. Pure existence means existence itself. I'm not talking about an existing thing. Pure consciousness means consciousness by itself. I'm not talking about a particular conscious experience like seeing or hearing or thinking. Pure bliss does not mean a particular feeling of bliss. It is that which appears as all feelings of bliss, more or less. And that pure existence, pure consciousness, pure being, you are. So this is the meaning of this wonderful mantra. Um, the sun does not shine, they, uh, reveal it. Uh, nor the stars, nor the moon, nor the lightning, uh, well, what to speak of this mortal fire. Now this concludes the second section of the second chapter. It is a wonderful section because uh, Nachiketa's original question that, um, you know, uh, what is that self? This question started with the question of death, but what is that trans which transcends that, that that is in this body, when the body dies, it's still there. And with the changing body, changing mind, one constant reality, what is that? What is that which is immortal? That is the question. And the clear answer is give, given again and again and again in this section. This section is sort of the climax of the whole Upanishad. One more section remains. Remember the structure of the Upanishad. It has two chapters. Chapter 1, Chapter 2. Chapter 1 has three parts. Chapter 2 has three parts. We are on the last part of the second chapter. Trityavalli. 
now we shall start the first mantra so what will um, if the highest truth has already been given what will yamaraja the king of death what will he do now in this last section he will do three things he will tell us about brahman the knowledge of brahman um, the practices how to get it you might think he's already done that yes he's sort of uh, winding it up he will tell us some more about the practices of how to get this knowledge of brahman and finally he will give us the results of the knowledge of brahman so it's a kind of wrapping up section this third section final section of the second chapter and then the kathu upanishad comes to an end first mantra urdhva moolam avakshaka esho ashvatha sanatana tadeva shukram tad brahma tadeva amrita mucchate tasmin loka shrita sarve tadu natyeti kashchana etadvaitat So, let us see how Gambiranji Maharaj translates this mantra. This is the big, beginningless people tree which has its roots above and branches down. That which is its root is pure, that is Brahman, and that is called immortal. On that are fixed all the worlds, none transcends that. This is verily that. So, what does this mean? Urdhva Mulam Avakshaka. So this is a tree called an Ashwatha tree or people tree. Now this, those who have read the Gita might immediately remind you of the 15th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. Purushottam Yoga, the 15th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita, which we have not come to yet in the Gita class, where uh, Sri Krishna will begin with quoting this. So he happily plagiarizes. He takes up literally the verses just straight away and quotes it. But in the Vedic tradition, you know, you can do that with the Upanishads. You know, Upanishads are the source, are the proof of your spirituality. Even Sri Ramakrishna, Swami Vivekananda writes about Sri Ramakrishna. Sri Ramakrishna is not the proof of the Upanishads. The Upanishads is the proof of Sri Ramakrishna. Um, the Upa Upanishads, Gita is not the proof um, you know, the, Krishna is not the proof of the Gita. So the Upanishads, which is the proof of Krishna and his teachings in the Gita. So this is the source from which all of them are drawn. Krishna quotes many things from the Upanishads in the Bhagavad Gita. So if you know the Upanishads, you immediately see that where these verses come from. And especially from this Upanishad, from the Katha Upanishad, is quoted a number of shlokas in the Bhagavad Gita. One is the beginning of the 15th chapter. Here he talks about Yama, the king of death, tells the little boy Nachiketa about this extraordinary tree where the roots are supposed to be invisible and high up and the branches are down here amidst us. Usually the roots are underground but here it's reversed it seems the way the example is given. Same example 15th chapter Krishna starts the roots are high and invisible and the branches are down among, amongst us and that, that's how he starts the 15th chapter of the Bhagavad Gita. 15th chapter is very important, especially for monks. You don't get to eat unless you memorize the 15th chapter. So in the Himalayas, and in one of our ashrams, that is the Sarada Pit outside Belurmat, you chant the whole 15th chapter before you eat. So in the Himalayas, in the ashrams, when you go there, the monks, you will see they are chanting. And when they are chanting the whole 15th chapter, not just the Brahma Pranam Brahma Havri, which is done in many of our ashrams, most of our ashrams, uh, but the whole 15th chapter. Brahmarpanam Brahmahavi is from the fourth chapter of Bhagavad Gita. The 15th chapter starts and you have to complete the whole 15th chapter before you put a morsel of food in your mouth. So that's how you have to memorize this chapter, at least if you're going to eat. And there the universe is described as this upside down tree. It's this wonderful example. And that example Sri Krishna has taken verbatim, bodily lifted from the Katha Upanishad. Urdhva Moolam, the roots are high up, transcendent, in, invisible. Avak, below, down below, here in our world, are the branches. This Ashwatha tree or people tree. But it's a strange Ashwatha tree. It's Sanatana. It's eternal. It's going on and on and on. Beginningless. Those roots, the source of this tree, the reality of this tree, Tadeva Shukram, it is bright. It is pure consciousness. It is pure. 
तद ब्रह्म दैट इज ब्रह्म द वैस्ट तदेव अमृतम दैट इज द मॉर्टैलिटी इज सेड टू बी मॉर्टल और इमोर्टैलिटी तस्मिन लोकाश्रिता सर्वे ऑल द वर्ल्ड्स इन वेदांत वी टॉक अबाउट और इंडियन कॉस्मोलॉजी टॉक अबाउट फोर्टीन वर्ल्ड्स वी कैन से ऑल द वर्ल्ड्स ऑल द प्लैनेट्स एंड वर्ल्ड्स एंड गैलेक्सीज व्हाट नॉट ऑल द फोर्टीन वर्ल्ड्स दे आर ऑल सेट इन दैट दे एग्जिस्ट इन दैट तदु नत्येति कश्चन नन ऑफ देम एक्सीड इट एक्सीड ब्रह्मन नन ऑफ द वर्ल्ड्स एक्सीड ब्रह्मन गो बियॉन्ड ब्रह्मन इवन इन द लीस्ट एतद्वैतत दिस इज व्हाट यू आस्क फॉर ओ नचिकेता and as you get to my think i asked a question why is he going on and on about an upside down tree this is what i'm talking what i'm saying is an answer to your question so here there is a description of the universe as this so called upside down tree now here in this mantra shankaracharya gives an extensive commentary and he lets loose he cuts loose with his poetic talents you know like describes samsara he describes samsara as this tree the world which we are living in how it is described by this tree upside down tree so i will read a little bit of shankara's original sanskrit very nice to hear but before that i'll read the english so that those who know they can follow the sanskrit and enjoy it so shankaracharya explains this tree is that which has its roots above what is the roots above the root that is the state of supreme vishnu saguna brahman ishwara saguna brahman ishwara god is the creator of this universe god is the root just as the roots sustain samsara as roots sorry the roots sustain this tree people tree like that god is the one which sustains this world just as the roots themselves are invisible because they are under the ground in this case of the strange tree the roots are high above high means not physically high subtle invisible beyond our understanding so they are they are god god is the root of this samsara tree and shankaracharya says urdhva moolam tad vishnu paramam padam he says avyaktadi sthavarantah samsara viksha so from from the avyakta from the unmanifest from ishwara with the power of maya what is the unmanifest the power of maya down to trees and plants all the heavens and earths and hells all kinds of beings including human beings down to the simplest of living beings a blade of grass all of that is this tree then he goes on you will see how he really has a good time describing samsara what does he say this samsara it consists of many evils such as birth old age death sorrow and so on it changes every moment that no sooner it is seen than its nature is destroyed it comes and goes day to day changes this entire universe it's like magic it's like water in a mirage it's like a city in the sky and it ceases to exist ultimately like a tree like a tree dies the samsara also will go one day it has no essence sara like the stem of a plantain tree shankaracharya's language janma jara marana shokadi aneka anathatmaka pratikshanam anyatha swabhav birth death old age sorrow all kinds of misery and unpleasantness in this world and always changing pratikshana anyatha swabhava changes people change circumstances change place changes our bodies change minds change things change all the time what is it like maya like like magic marijudaka like a mirage water water is not there but looks like water gandharva nagara like a city in the skies especially when you fly in a plane nowadays shankaracharya did not have that uh, experience we fly in a plane and you see the cloud formations all around you they look like uh, mountains and castles and people i don't know all sorts of uh, thoughts superimposed on the cloud formations like a city of the gandharvas a city in the sky which means illusory 
Nagaradi, Nagaradi vat drishta nashta swarupatvat. You see it one moment, next moment it's gone. This is the nature of samsara. And then he goes on further. What is the, uh, what is the, uh, you know, the truth about this? And people say, what's going on here? What's the truth? Shankaracharya says, it is subject to hundreds of doubts in the minds of skeptics. The seekers of truth cannot determine its reality. What is going on here? We don't know. Its essence lies in its root, the supreme Brahman ascertained in Vedanta. Vedanta determines what's going on here by looking at its root. What is root? Saguna Brahman, Ishvara, God, Bhagavan. Shankaracharya says here, Oh, that plantain tree example. Kadali stambhavat nissara. <laughs> like the stem of a plantain tree, there is no uh, inner core to it. The more you open it up, you just, it's nothing in there. Just layer after layer. Then he goes on and he says, Tattva jigyasubi. He says, Aneka pakhanda buddhi vikalpaspada. It is the source of all sorts of speculations by fools. And Tattva Jigyasu, those who want to know what's going on here, uh, he says, Anirdharita Tattva. It, it cannot be ascertained. It is uh, Anirvachanya. It cannot be expressed as this or that. But what does Vedanta so? Vedanta determines what it is. How does it do so? Vedanta Nirdharita Parabrahma Mula. Parabrahma Mula Sara. Vedanta sees that it is the source is Brahman with the power of Maya or God. Then what else? Why does this samsara come at all? It says, it grows from the seed of ignorance, desire and action from the unmanifested. And Shankaracharya's language, he says, avidya kama karma avyakta bija prabhava. So from maya, it emerges. Why does it emerge? Because of ignorance. Whose ignorance? Ignorance, our Combined ignorance, all of us, we are ignorant about our real nature as Brahman from that ignorance. What's wrong with being ignorant? Well, we, don't, we don't stop at ignorance. Avidya then Kama. Being ignorant of, of our ever-fulfilled nature, Purna nature, we think we are Apurna. We are these little bodies, little minds. And the moment we think we are these little bodies and minds in this vast, difficult world, we have desires. There are certain things we want. They seem tempting. There are certain things which are scary for us as these little bodies and minds. Bodies are perishable. They can be hurt. Minds are even more delicate. We can be insulted, frustrated, um, deprived, traumatized. So there are things we are scared of. There are things which we want. Karma. Desire arises. It is inevitable. You can't stop it. If ignorance is there, desire will arise. Karma. And then what happens? Whatever we do in the world, avidya, karma, karma, our actions in the world are prompted by desire. We want certain things and we act accordingly. This is Shankaracharya's favorite phrase, avidya kama karma. Why are we here? What's going on? Avidya kama karma. What's the proof that he's right? The proof is those who do not have avidya, those who have gone beyond ignorance, the enlightened ones, they seem to be beyond samsara. They seem to be the ones who seem fulfilled. They have no problem at all. So that's the proof that it works. And that's the proof that he has got this formulation right. We are trapped in the law in the law of karma. We have done karma, we are getting the results. But karma cannot be avoided if we have desire. So be, under, underlying karma is desire, karma. But desire cannot be avoided if you don't know your true nature, your infinite nature, avidya. So avidya, karma, karma. Karma puts, traps us in the law of karma. Lifetime after lifetime, we are whirled around. But law, karma we cannot avoid if we have desire, karma, and desire is inevitable if we have ignorance. So the root has to be to remove this ignorance, but to find out who or what we are. And then he goes on. Sarva prani linga bheda skanda. This, the trunk of this samsara tree is the combined subtle bodies of all sentient beings. All our minds, all our personalities taken together, all sentient beings together, they form the trunk of this. And then he goes on. 
बुद्धि इंद्रिय विषय प्रवाद अंकुर श्रुति स्मृति न्याय विद्या उपदेश पलाश यज्ञ दान तप आदि अनेक क्रिया सुपुष्प सुख दुख वेदना अनेक रस and he says what's going on here in this world what are the experiences like what's going on here is its growth results from the sprinkling of the water of desire it is irrigated by the water of desire it has for its tender sprouts the objects of the sense knowledge you know things which we see hear smell taste touch those are the sprouts its leaves the leaves of this tree are the vedas the smritis logic learning education in all kinds of knowledge and instruction and its lovely flower supushpa are the many deeds that we do good ones sacrifice charity austerity bad ones he just says etc and its various tastes what does it feel like to be in this samsara he says the experience of happiness and sorrow and innumerable fruits the fruits are the means of subsistence of beings who are the beings the birds which come and sit on this tree there are innumerable birds which come and sit on this tree and we are those birds it has for its nests they do the birds and they build their nest in this samsara and they build their nest in samsara what are the nests the nests are the seven worlds beginning from the world from the one called satya loka satya loka is the highest heaven brahma loka we call it the seventh heaven that's also part of samsara because that's the whole range of coming and going the seven heavens and the seven hells where are we we are the first of the heavens so in the upper worlds the first one is matya loka this one so so this is actually a good world there are seven nastier worlds below us below means not physically below they are sometimes depicted as below and uh, heavens are above but these are spheres of experience the seven heavens are pleasant experiences if you have lots of good karma a lot of good credit and the seven hells are if you run out of credit the bank comes and disposes uh, you and you end up being homeless on the streets so that is a kind of hell the seven hells so seven worlds which are built by the birds which are the living beings from brahma downwards from the highest god god with small g down to the little plant or grass we are somewhere in between human beings so all of this is there he gives the in description sukha dukha vedana aneka rasa uh, then he goes on to say satya namadi sapta loka the seven worlds starting with satya highest sapt satya loka brahmadi bhut pakshi krita neela from the highest god brahma down to the most humble creature these are the little birds which make its they make their nests on this tree of samsara and then he goes on what does it sound like the tree is not a peaceful tree it's full of noise the birds are chirping some are singing some are uh, screaming here shankaracharya outdoes himself he says it has uproar there is an uproar rendered tumultuous through the various sounds arising from dancing singing instrumental music play jest clapping laughing uh, pulling crying exclaiming alas alas leave me leave me alone induced by mirth and grief arising from the enjoyment and pain of living beings this is what samsara sounds like uh, clapping and cheering and, and parties and wailing and screaming and terror and trauma all of it take a global view of samsara right now if you hear all the sounds of humanity and all living creatures good deal of it will be very bad will be will be terrifying in sanskrit he says sukha dukha udbhuta harsha shok shok jat nritya geeta and so on and then he says hasita akrishta rudita ha ha muncha muncha ityadi aneka shabda krita 
the ha ha in sanskrit is, is means alas in english not the ha ha in english it just means just the exact opposite of what it means, means in english uh, ha ha in english is delight in sanskrit it is alas it says alas alas leave me alone let me go muncha muncha all of us have a share of grief and if you think you're a swami very good you made your escape you are not vulnerable samsara makes you very vulnerable if you are especially if you have beloved ones you know but then you hear about it from people who are suffering and sort of the world's sorrows are put on display before you how much suffering and very little of that suffering can be easily dealt with you know it's so deep seated in our psyches we are we have made ourselves vulnerable to it Aneka Shabda Tumuli Bhuta. It's like Maharava. Maharava means great is the uproar of samsara. How do you deal with it? What's the solution to this? Vedanta Vihita Brahmatma Darshana Asanga Shastra Krita Ucheda Esha Samsara Vriksha Ashwatha. The only way Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita is to cut it firmly. With the axe of Vedanta. Cut the, at the root of samsara. What is the root of samsara? Ignorance of its underlying, of the, uh, underlying reality. What is the underlying reality? Brahman. How do you realize this Brahman? Brahmatma uh, Sakshar Krita. I am this Brahman. I am not this little bird chirping and crying in one of the leaves. In one of the branches. Tasting sweet fruits and mostly bitter fruits. No. I am one with the root. I am the source of this samsara. I am Brahman. You realize that? That's the axe. In Gita, Krishna makes it even more explicit. He talks about the axe. Uh, Asanga shastrena dhridena chitva tatap tat padam parimar gitabhyam. Uh, he says, cutting at the root of this uh, samsara vriksha. What is at the root? Ignorance of Brahman. Brahman is the source. But ignorance leads to samsara. Ignorance of the source leads to samsara. Cut at the root uh, by detachment, by the realization. He, Sankaracharya says, Brahmatma. Um, he says, I am Brahmatma Darshana. I realize I am Brahman. And this is um, Asanga Shastra. This is the weapon, the axe of detachment. Then you realize all these words are none other than a display of magic, like mirage water, like the city of uh, city in the sky. They have no reality of their own. And they do disappear. They fade away into nothingness. This is the incredible des description of samsara. <laughs> Shankaracharya writing 1,400 years ago. Esha Ashwatha. Shankaracharya says, Another meaning of Ashwatra is that which does not stay till tomorrow. It is impermanent. It's always shaking. It's blown. This samsara uh, tree is as if it's always blown in a storm. It's stormy. And what is the storm? He says, um, Kama Karma Vata. By the, the, the stormy winds of karma. This karma which has come from desire. My good and bad karma are blowing me around in samsara. Where were you born? Where were you brought up and educated? Where did you marry and settle down with your uh, family? Where did you go for work, for study? Where are you living now? Where will you be 5 years, 10 years, 20 years down from now? Who are the people you started the world with? Whom did you grow up with? Whom are you living with now? Who will be there with you 20, 30, 40 years later? Hmm. Look at your own body, the progression of your body from childhood to youth to middle age to inevitable old age deterioration and death. Look at the changes in the mind. Look at the world around you changing. Karma. We are being blown around by the stormy winds of karma which has come from our past, desire, from our desires. Anitya, prachalita swabhava. Impermanent and continuously in motion. This, this uh, tree is swaying perilously because of past karma. 
what happens swarga naraka tiriyak pretadi vihi shaka vihi avak shaka the branches what are the branches there are higher branches up in the sky which are the heavens in which the gods small g gods dwell and having a great time there are the middle branches in which we dwell having a mixed time of it and there are the lower branches in which the demons of hell dwell having a terrible time of it so sanatana this is this is eternal eternal in what sense beginningless how when did it start we want to know who is the nut case who put the seed in the ground and <laughs> which gave rise to this horrible tree well there is no beginning to this it's beginningless but it can come to an end it can come to an end when we become enlightened at least for the one who is enlightened you are set free what do you need to know tadevam shukram tad brahma at the source of this samsara tree is pure existence pure consciousness pure bliss Now, why pure did you not hear what we just said earlier because the sun cannot illuminate the nor the stars nor the moon nor the fire nor the lightning it is not an object you cannot see it as an object it is pure consciousness that pure consciousness and that is brahman brahman literally means the vast that pure consciousness which is brahman the vast tadeva amritam that is immortality there is no immortality in this tree you are in this tree you will be whirled around from lifetime to lifetime mrityu sa mrityu mapnoti the upanishad says from death to death he goes the one who does not know who he is who you are tadeva amritam it is immortality he is not talking about one little consciousness i am the, not the body not the mind one little consciousness i am no he says tasmin loka shita sarve all the worlds are set in this brahman what do you mean set in this brahman just like all pottery is set in clay all golden all golden ornaments are set in gold that means they're nothing but gold all the pots are nothing but clay all these worlds are nothing but brahman as existence pure being tadu natyeti kashchana none of them transcend brahman transcend means very simple none of them can be without brahman can the pot be without clay impossible clay can exist without the pot brahman can exist without this universe this universe cannot exist for a moment without brahman it's like saying can you exist without existence of course not no ornament can exist without gold but gold can exist without being an ornament it can be something else so this is brahman etad dvaitat this is that that what Was that what you asked for, Nachiketa? You asked this question. Remember, here is the answer. All right. The next verse is there. We will go on next time. Let's see if there are questions. So here in this third section, um, final section, Yama has started off by once again describing Brahman as Jagat Karanam, as the cause of this universe, the material cause of this universe. is that from which the entire universe emerges in which it stays into which it disappears and this need not be the case if you know yourself as brahman you will realize being alone exists there is a clay alone is there no matter if it's pot if it's appearing as a pot it's still clay no matter if it's appearing as samsara samsara is an appearance like um, uh, clouds in the sky like water in a mirage like a show of magic brahman alone exists that which truly exists is you this is the knowledge let's take a look at the questions shiva priya is this the state of sthita pragya when the search stops um not yet sthita pragya is when you can manifest your enlightenment sthita pragya and notice what it mean the literal meaning of sthita pragya pragya means wisdom realization so this what we are talking about is the realization is the wisdom sthita stabilized steady so is there an unsteady wisdom there can be there can be when we read all this we are inspired by it it's still unsteady when we are not only inspired by it it becomes clear to us still unsteady 
when we it's not only clear to us and we are inspired by it we make a breakthrough and we begin to see for the first time we have found it still unsteady why unsteady because you see in your life are you able to manifest it are you able to live the life do you, have you gone beyond sorrow it promises samsara will be over for you if you realize this has it happened or are you still shaken by the winds of karma when particularly nasty things happen you must come to the stage where uh, if the entire universe is present you're fine with it you say it's all right if the entire universe disappears in samadhi in deep sleep or at the end of the universe you're still fine with it because there's not one extra thing if all the parts disappear the total quantity of clay is it still there or not yes if all the golden ornaments are melted back into gold the substance the reality the gold is it still there or not exactly the same it's still the same just the names and forms have disappeared so you are fine you brahman are fine if the words are appearing in you you're still fine if nothing appears all the objects disappear you're still fine because you have not been reduced a little bit and if the entire universe appears before you you have nothing has changed for you even a little bit and then you are absolutely fine that kind of incredible centeredness in brahman and that's not easy so there are two kinds of objections arise one is people don't want this world to disappear that's the materialist thing they want to hold on to this world i want to hold on to people even people who are nasty to me it's impossible just say solitary confinement is a punishment you know and then after all who is the criminal with in the in the jail in the in the prison other criminals they are not good company why wouldn't you want to be in solitary but no that is even worse than being with the group of criminals being in solitary we don't want to give up the world and look at the yogi who goes into a forest into a mountain cave and be, is solitary out of choice and happy so first of all the materialist obsession with the world i want to hold on to it i am not okay if the world is not there people are not there entertaining programs are not there on tv um, uh, um, good food and good entertainment is not there good conversation is not there then i am not okay that must go i must be fine and then there is the the um, uh, other kind who are fine with letting go of the world and they want the peace of samadhi they want the peace of the mountain they want the peace of the ashram the peace of the retreat but they are not okay with the presence of the world so this is often spiritual people when you you are tired of the illusoriness and the problems of samsara you want to get rid of samsara you want peace but that that's good that's the beginning of spirituality but that's not the uh, sthita pragya established in wisdom you should be And the enlightened one should be happy that's why krishna teaches vedanta in the middle of the battlefield the worst kind of samsara the worst kind of samsara can you be centered in brahman and see the um, that same reality even if the manifestation is so awful like a battlefield so with the presence of samsara you are fine with the absence of samsara you are fine then only our understanding is complete and then sthita it must be steady one sadhu put it nice this sthita means ghar mein rehta hai ya bhatakta hai your understanding is, is does it stay at home as brahman or does it go what is that movie baby's day out so does it go baby's day out your understanding a little bit of the world little bit of people little bit of relationships little bit of entertainment little bit of fight little bit of uh, nostalgia little bit of children grandchildren this is baby's day out it walks around in the world <laughs> so sthita pragya means is it centered is it stable but first this understanding is of a great help this understanding which we get this breakthrough is a tremendous this is most this is central this breakthrough is central then you need to stabilize it um bhargava says Maharaj, so we can call the text as negators or negating knowledge. Yes, it negates ignorance. It negates the wrong understanding. When you are using a mind tool, isn't it important to keep it sharp, conditioned, and consistent? Of course, for sadhana, of course. That's why 
purity of mind and focus of mind is necessary for sadhana. Karma yoga and upasana, meditation, is always recommended. Otherwise, it won't work. See, if mind is impure, no interest will be there in spiritual life. Or if it is interesting, you need, you like the songs, you like the, um, you know, it's architecture of the church and the beautiful hymns. Uh, that's all very nice. It's sublime. It's not yet spiritual. Um, then I like spiritual life, but I don't get this Vedanta. To get it even um, requires a sharp mind and a pure mind. More than a sharp mind, a pure mind is necessary. Rama says, is Brahmakar Vritti an object in the mind? If so, that required for the breakthrough or can one attain a breakthrough by just blanking out one's mind? Not by blanking out one's mind. Um, concentration of mind is essential, but according to Vedanta, Brahmakara Vritti, the mind getting that moment of insight, that aha moment. I saw twice in the inspired talks, Vivekananda uses the word flash and it is done. He says twice. So there is a moment of breakthrough. The Brahmakara Vritti comes. It's very much the mind. And yet more than the mind. If you look at Vedanta Sara, what happens in the Brahmakara Vritti? The two components of Brahmakara Vritti, that moment of enlightenment. The two components are the Vritti Vyapti and Phala Vyapti. I'm not going to explain that now. Uh, so in Brahmakara Vritti, Vritti Vyapti is there, but Phala Vyapti is not necessary. This is the crucial difference between the realization of Brahman and the knowledge, the ordinary knowledge of the world. So mind is necessary because Vritti Vyapti is necessary. And yet the mind is not necessary because Phala Vyapti is not necessary for Brahma Jnana. If all this sounds like gibberish to you, Vedanta Sar. You have to go back and look at Vedanta Sar. Shiva Priya says self-revealing is Bodhe Bodh. Yes, awareness of awareness. But that ultimate state is Samadhi, achievable by Ishwar Koti, may not be Brahma Jnani, right? No. It is achievable by everybody. Samadhi is the Bodhe Bodh. You realize that you are awareness. And centered in that, um, shut down the mind. Immerse the mind in that realization that will give you samadhi. But according to Advaita Vedanta, it is that bodha, that realization which is most important. Samadhi is secondary. According to Advaita Vedanta, it is that inquiry, this inquiry which we are doing. You sit down quietly and do this inquiry. That will give you uh, enlightenment. And samadhi can follow. Or proceed or follow. That um, one inquiry was suggested by Yama here itself. The chariot example. The senses are the horses. Then the rain is the mind. The driver, the intellect is the driver. And you are the witness, the passenger. And the, it's pancha kosha vichara. The five levels of uh, the personality. Inquiry into that. And Sri Ram says, it's self-refulgent, same as consciousness. Swaprakasha. It is consciousness. Consciousness is self-refulgent. It's not lit up by anything else. It is self-lit and it lights up everything else. Patrick says, why does Krishna talk about cutting this tree down? Yes, that sounds so bad, cutting this tree down, but we must. I remember the 15th chapter of the Gita, uh, we were studying it at Harvard Divinity School. And uh, there was a mixed group of students. One student, this girl, she was very concerned about trees. Her whole point was about trees. And we came to that portion of the Gita where Krishna talks about cut this tree firmly down with the acts of detachment. And she was so shocked and unhappy. Um, because this is samsara. This is what we are trying to do. Don't worry. It won't contribute to the um, <laughs> greenhouse problem if you cut this tree down. Sri Ram says consciousness is the quality of Brahman. No, consciousness is not quality of Brahman. Consciousness is Brahman. The Vedantic expression extolling the other two aspects of Brahman. Aspects means Brahman is existence, Brahman is consciousness, Brahman is bliss. Taiti Upanishad, there are portions which talks about Brahman as Ananda. Anandam Brahmeti Vijana. Brahman is bliss. In Chandogya Upanishad, Brahman is described as Sat. Sadeva Samyaidama At the beginning of this universe, there was being alone, existence alone. So in some Upanishads, you get Sat, pure being. So here you get chit, consciousness, that shining, everything shines. In right theory, you get ananda, bliss. So they're all talking about the same thing. Because it, it shines, it gives us the experience of life itself. Therefore, you are consciousness. 
because your own everything you can deny you cannot deny your own existence that consciousness therefore it is the truth it is sat and the unlimited nature of this sat chit existence consciousness is bliss yeah sat chit ananda and it is self evident all the time we don't see it ah uh, shri ram says ashwatthama inverted tree is emblematic of shri ishwar srishti versus jiva srishti yes so when you cut down that tree the jiva srishti will be gone uh, i'm not going to explain this this is terms used by panchadashi vidyarnya swami there is a creation by the by god the creation of this universe and the five elements the stars and planets and the world our own bodies minds but there's a creation we make up what is the our creation i am this body god hasn't told you that i am this little being and i have these desires and i do these naughty things papa all of this is our srishti and we suffer because of that so vidyarnya swami in panchadashi he makes this analysis even the tree itself the creation of god never gives sorrow to anybody it is our creation which gives us sorrow like a person in a dream having a nightmare everything is fine but person is suffering the suffering is entirely generated by that person what is the way to get out of it is to wake up similarly the enlightened one wakes up and realizes i am brahman does the world disappear no does the body disappear no everything goes on as it is even the physical problems in the body also remain and yet that person honestly can claim i have attained bliss i have attained freedom so the existence the appearance of the world appearance of the body is not a problem if it the appearance nature is realized that it is nothing other than brahman and i am that brahman let it appear as i said let the objects appear you should be fine with it let the objects disappear you should be fine with it is there any to symbolic meaning for the tree being inverted yes so what we see the branches and leaves and uh, and the, the nests built by the birds and the fruits uh, flowers all are down here in an actual tree what happens they are up there and the root is down but here the root the source is transcendent is invisible of course in a real tree also the root is invisible although banyan tree the roots are also visible they come out the external roots but here the real root saguna brahman ishwara invisible uh, it is we don't see it but the source is there source is god nila vora says you probably explained it earlier how do we explain as exist the physical things that don't seem to have consciousness uh, because uh, Uh, Ishwara, Saguna Brahman, with the power of Maya, has created the five elements, mm-hmm. and these five elements—space and uh, air and water and f- fire and water and earth—they combine together. Part of that goes to combining and making our minds, which reflect consciousness and gives us the experience of conscious experience, you know, thinking, feeling, and all that. But part of it goes and becomes objects of experience: tables, chairs, um, our bodies. so these objects don't seem to have consciousness though uh, brahman uh, vedanta will say ultimately everything not only has consciousness is consciousness but in some cases consciousness is manifest in some cases consciousness is not manifest where it is easily manifest are beings sentient beings like us with minds in those minds consciousness is manifest and we behave like little creatures in tables and chairs consciousness is there as you see existence is manifest most manifest there chairs tables everywhere existence is common but we don't feel consciousness there without the mind subtle body consciousness will not be manifest swami is vasana as a component of uh, sukshma sharira you mean leading to rebirth and sprouting as karmas yes vasanas the uh, accumulated impressions of past lives are in the subtle body and they go on from lifetime to lifetime physical body is die but the subtle body is go on stula sharira dies sukshma sharira goes on and they fructify from lifetime to lifetime okay kalpana says is it true that vedanta describes saguna brahman alone and all reference to nirguna is the language of negation no saguna brahman you can describe it because it's a positive description is possible god is omniscient omnipotent omnipresent god is loving god is just god is beautiful and the only way you can indicate nirguna brahman is by negating all possible ascriptions to it but equally vedanta upanishads refer to nirguna brahman and saguna brahman nirguna brahman is the absolute reality 
which appears as Saguna Brahman, world and individual, Jiva, Jagat, Ishwara. If you are a Jiva, if you, if you just think that I am this and that's all, then for you, there is the world, other Jivas are there and God is there, Saguna Brahman. If you do Vedantic inquiry, until you do Vedantic inquiry, the only religion um, uh, or the, for the most part, I'm ignoring Buddhism here, um, for the most part, religion is worship of God. It's Saguna Brahman. Saguna Brahman is that same Nirguna Brahman, but with the clothing of the boss. But when you do a Vedantic inquiry, you realize, some are looking happy, you realize that I am the boss. No, no, no. There is no boss, there is no servant. And there is no office also. It's one, one reality dreaming all this up. And you are free of the whole show. Though the appearance of the show will continue, the movie, the cinema will continue. We should be happy with the cinema continuing, with the cinema switched up. Be perfectly centered and at peace with it. And that is Pratishthita, centered Pragya, the, the enlightenment which is centered. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ram Krishna Arpanamastu.